Thank you very much. Um, it's after lunch. I think I'm the last speaker, so I won't bore you with a lot of technical stuff. My uh, talk is mainly from a user perspective, so somewhat similar to Jim's talk. So I just wanted to share with you some of the experiences uh, that we've been through in the last few years consolidating all of our HPC resources. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, if I can make this work. No. Let's see, maybe not. Let's use this. How about that? What is Orbital ATK? We uh, merged two companies, Orbital Sciences and uh, ATK merged about in 2015. Both of them were in the aerospace defense uh, fields, so their headquarters is in Dulles, Virginia. I'm trying to click this. It used to work, but I guess it lost contact or something. Give me a second. There we go. There we go. This is a little bit of details. Maybe you're interested and maybe not. 4.6 uh, billion revenue in 2017 expected. 12,500 employees and uh, 4,000 engineers and scientists. And we're spread out all over the US. Major locations, as you can see, in eight states. and. Uh, smaller locations, another 12. Quick look at uh, our business. So there's three different business lines. Uh, on the far left is a flight systems group, which is where I sit. Launch vehicles, uh, composite uh, skins for Airbus, Boeing, and many other uh, composite uh, components, including rocket motor cases. Defense systems groups is focused on uh, armament systems and special products for our armed forces. And then there's a satellite systems group that uh, is mostly out in Virginia, commercial and military type satellites. So you can see the chart shows you our business segments and the revenue from each of those. Anybody can, uh, does anybody hear me back there? I'm okay? Sounding okay. All right. Just wanted to show you a quick video. And here we have the crew. The Explorers. The Defenders of Freedom. The Global Business Leaders. The Visionaries. That sound confirmed. At Orbital ATK, these are our customers, and we are dedicated to providing them with affordable, reliable systems and products that allow them to carry out their missions. With 12,500 employees in 20 states in our flight systems, defense systems, and space systems businesses, Orbital ATK is dedicated to being the partner you can count on. Orbital ATK's Flight Systems Group is a leading global provider of launch vehicles, propulsion systems, and composite structures for defense, civil government, commercial, and international applications. Our space launch vehicles have conducted more than 70 missions, boosting more than 160 commercial, civil, and government payloads into orbit. Orbital ATK is also a major supplier of missile defense interceptors and target rockets, critical to the defense of our nation. Having delivered more than 16,000 rocket motors to our customers for strategic defense, commercial, and scientific programs since 1960, Orbital ATK is the world's leading supplier of solid motor propulsion systems. We also provide advanced composite structures for commercial and military aircraft platforms, as well as for the majority of launch vehicles in the U.S. space program. Orbital ATK's Flight Systems Group delivers reliable products that help our customers' missions take flight. 
Our Defense Systems Group provides state-of-the-art, reliable products to support our ultimate customers, the country's warfighters. Our products, from ammunition, precision-guided weapons, aircraft survivability systems, and special mission aircraft, to air, sea, and land-based tactical rocket motors are relied upon by U.S. and Allied military forces across the globe. Since 2000, we have supplied more than 18 billion rounds of ammunition to military and commercial customers. Orbital ATK's medium caliber cannons, ranging from 7.62 millimeter and 50 caliber to 25 millimeter and 30 millimeter, boast unrivaled reliability and combat effectiveness. We take pride in knowing that our technologies help make the brave men and women in U.S. and allied militaries safe and successful. Orbital ATK's Space Systems Group provides affordable, reliable systems and services for high-value space, science, exploration, national security, and commercial missions. Over the past three decades, we have delivered more than 150 small and medium-class spacecraft platforms to customers worldwide. Our extensive line of space components have been integral to the success of hundreds of spacecraft missions and have traveled billions of miles across our solar system. And our advanced systems are leading the way in commercial spaceflight providing cargo delivery services to the International Space Station for NASA and developing innovative new ways to access and use space. With flight-proven designs and meticulous engineering, Orbital ATK space systems enable customer success in scientific discovery, national security, global communications, Earth imaging, and human space exploration. Orbital ATK is dedicated to delivering high quality, reliable systems and products to our customers on time and on budget. Our innovative technologies enable our customers' missions to take flight, support our armed forces to protect our nation, and help change our understanding of Earth and the universe beyond. In everything we do, Orbital ATK aims to be the partner you can count on. Just a brief uh, history of uh, HBC at our company. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I don't have a system slide that Jim had, but uh, it gives you an idea of the evolution of uh, HBC at our company. It, you can see on the far right, we used to be known as Thiokol, and that has evolved too. Now we're Orbital ATK, but I'll give you a little bit on that. So early 80s, uh, we used mainly IBM mainframes for batch computing tasks, and uh, computer simulation was uh, more of an experimentation. We were toying with it and using some homegrown codes, that sort of thing. But in the late 80s and mid 90s, uh, it's a huge uh, bump in what we use computer simulation for us, mainly fueled by the space shuttle booster redesign. Some of you uh, well, maybe uh, realize uh, what happened with the space shuttle Challenger. We had a very tight di got di timeline to redesign the rocket boosters. And that really saw a huge bump in our HPC needs. Uh, at that time, we didn't really have anything in-house, so most of the time we were using uh, time-sharing services. Now it's under the buzzword called cloud, but that's basically what it was. That brought uh, higher expectation from the customer and the type of models and the complexity and the fidelity of solutions, so it really fueled our uh, HBC needs quite a bit during those years. Physical testing was still necessary to validate our design, so that wasn't eliminated totally. 
In the late 90s and 2005, in that time range, uh, we decided it's better to have those resources in-house instead of paying lots of uh, per hour CPU charges with hundreds of dollars per CPU hour on the Cray. So we did that. We brought in Origins and Altix uh, systems, and that was our first exposure to PBS Pro as well. Of course, there were shared memory systems, so it wasn't quite a challenge back at that time. And then uh, we went to a, a three-year hardware cycle at the same time, which has really helped us out quite a bit. Keeps us uh, abreast of the latest technology and take advantage of the you know, reduced costs and those kinds of things. Then in 2006, uh, we stepped into the world of distributed memory clusters, and that was a very, uh, should I say, uh, what's, I'm not sure what the right word is, but was very apprehension. There's a lot of apprehension about going there because we're so comfortable with shared memory systems. And fortunately for us, uh, we had a, a local company to sort of hold our hand and make that transition. Then we got some confidence in distributed memory systems. In 2010, we had a pretty good size jump in our capacity with going to 1,200 cores cluster with Panassas storage. We, we bought that system uh, mainly in view of the space shuttle replacement program to address the computing needs for that. And that was uh, canceled back in 2010, and we didn't foresee that. And that is really what triggered our uh, journey to consolidating all of our HPC resources. Prior to that, it was just a, a local cluster for our Utah division to do the rocket motor designs. So we had all this excess capacity that we had to canvas around the company, say, we have this big machine, come, come and use it. You know, that, so a lot of people were a little bit apprehensive about that, but eventually, as I'll show you, it uh, has pro proven beneficial. So in 2013, we went to a 1600 core system from SGI. So at this time, people were really getting used to the idea of doing computer simulation. And it actually was expected. And the results from it were you know, trusted by management. So we were able to reduce the amount of physical testing little by little and rely on computer simulation. So in 2015, as I mentioned, we merged with Orbital Sciences, and uh, they had their own uh, HPC systems. We decided to consolidate that as well. So it's another big jump from 1,600 to almost 6,000 cores there, as you can see. And uh, we continued the Panassas storage. Uh, it's been working fairly well for us. We also, at that time, uh, implemented a, a nice DCV visualization system just because we had like 20 different sites across the country trying to access uh, a single consolidated system. And now, with 2015, we're at Orbital ATK. So it's went from Thiokol to ATK to Orbital ATK. Just a few examples um, of uh, what we're doing, the types of work we're doing, sim simulation work. This happens to be a, a launch abort motor and you can see the, um, the um, crew module capsule there being separated. This is a, a protection measure for some of our manned systems in case we encounter any issues with the launch vehicle, the crew can be ejected out of harm's way. So the example we have down here is an exhaust manifold that we're able to optimize uh, and do that on an HPC system and we're able to reduce the weight significantly. This is an example of a hazards analysis, what would happen if a motor blew up in a, in a building. This happens to be the uh, VAB in, uh, in Florida, vertical assembly building. So as you can see, it ran for eight days. Uh, this was done several years ago now, so in today's machines, probably won't run that long. This is uh, like a vector plot of what happens at launch time. 
when we have the space shuttle launch, how the temperatures, uh, or, or you can see the rise between the two rocket motors. It's not very intuitive, obviously. You would think it'd be pretty benign and symmetrical, but you can actually visualize what's happening between the motors. Now this is just another CFD example where we can, we can see how the uh, vortex shedding happens on a, on a launch vehicle. This is, uh, I couldn't share, I can't share a lot of the things we do. This is just the, what was been approved to, to show here, but this is a launch system, uh, launch pad simulation, ignition simulation with the launch pad included. You can see that it ran for a week in a thousand cores, so. Just a few examples, this is a, a simulation of a rocket motor, it's a test motor, it's a 24 inch motor. And you can see there's a lot of uh, things going on inside a rocket motor, very high temperatures and, and chemistry happening. But if we could do this in a simulated environment on a computer, it would save us significant, uh, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of dollars if we can eliminate one test. So HPC is used quite a bit. It's, some of the new growth areas that we're seeing is uh, since we have a system now which has significant capacity, new needs are coming up. One of them is computational chemistry. We're experimenting with a code called Gaussian. Some of you might have heard about that. And uh, MATLAB, which we didn't foresee, has increased quite a bit. MATLAB use on, on our HPC cluster doing parametric studies. Design exploration, so previously we were doing like a single point deterministic solution. Now we're more into exploring the design space and optimizing uh, our designs. A new requirement from some of our customers is this uh, stochastic process of uncertainty quantification, determining the reliability. And in order to do that, you have to have run multiple cases uh, to determine what the reliability is. So our workload is continually increasing. That's the message here. Just want to share with you some of the uh, benefits and challenges of consolidation. And some companies have chosen to stay with uh, individual local clusters. And others like us have uh, launched into a consolidation project. And there's pros and cons with doing either one, right? So just wanted to share some of those with you. The obvious uh, consolidation benefit is uh, cost avoidance in several areas. I think a few other speakers uh, pointed this out already. The facilities, we had, I don't know, five or six independent clusters at different locations. So we say we're saved in terms of facilities and software tools and compilers, diagnostics tools, and most importantly, HPC uh, skill sets. So we have a single cluster and a, and a single uh, support group in one location instead of six different sites with different schedulers, different managers, and all those kind of things. Workload balancing across different divisions is a huge, huge benefit. If each uh, site couldn't expand be beyond whatever size a cluster they were afford to, could afford to buy, for example, a 512 cluster, core cluster, they couldn't expand beyond that, even there's a workload spike with a large system like that, you can balance workloads and each site is able to access a lot more capacity than they could afford individually. That's a huge benefit. And then the corporate data center benefits. Some of the sites had these clusters sitting in different areas which were not really secure and there was no uh, data sta retention standards, those kind of things. So. That way, that was beneficial as well. Where this is a, this is an obvious one. We're able to get better discounts from our suppliers because we're buying a very much larger machine. The other big benefit, like I mentioned earlier, is the ability to use unused cycles to do a lot of design studies and so improve your overall design. Because it. it doesn't uh, come without challenges. Some of the challenges are, are people challenges, right? The culture, people um, were unwilling to 
accept a consolidated uh, system and a central system because they were used to having a local cluster in the next room and they had a local system administrator. They could tell them what to do. Now suddenly it's far away in another part of the country and they don't have much control over it and some of the policies were being viewed as restrictive. So we had to overcome some of those challenges mainly by our support level. So we had to respond and keep customers happy so they, they see the benefit in the long term. So that took a few years. Project prioritization across different business groups, that's a, another challenge that we face every day. One particular division or department would suddenly have uh, some kind of a failure investigation. They say, hey, we need a thousand cores for the next three weeks. We have to get through this or we're going to be you know, penalized by our customers. So suddenly we have to push aside all the other workloads and, and give them priorities. That's a daily challenge that we face. Administrative challenges, uh, managing policies uh, across all the different applications and divisions and their sites and their expected number of cores each site wants to be able to access. That's a constant daily challenge. Software licensing. So we don't provide licensing for commercial software as part of our HPC services, they bring their own software. So if you have a particular site as a software license, we can access the license server from the HPC, but they bring their own license. So managing that, and in some cases, there's pooled corporate licenses. So managing all of that has to be built into our uh, submission job, submission scripts based on groups. Policy dashboard, that's something I would love to see from Altair. Um, I, constantly I'm looking to see some user will send me an email saying, why isn't my job running? And then I have to go find out what the policy is in effect. Hey, you you had uh, an increased capacity for the two weeks. Now, you know, the two weeks are up, so you can't run that many jobs anymore. So this is a constantly changing scenario day by day. So it'd be very nice to have a, a services dashboard. There's no, there's a system dashboard which is a system administrator type of tool. But for someone like me who is overseeing the services and have to answer to the different divisions and how well a customer, customer needs are met from the different divisions, it would be nice to have a, a policy dashboard of sorts. Uh, system policy change simulation tool. I think the, this is something that uh, PBR, Altair is trying to address in a simulation tool, it'd be very nice to, to have, what if, what if I changed my prime hours from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. instead of 6 a.m. to 6 p.m.? You know, how does that affect the system and what jobs flow through? Because we have different limits, user limits and license limits for prime hours and non-prime hours. So I'd like to be able to see that, so it'd be very useful. Funding challenges, uh, if it's a single site, I can go to the engineering manager and IS manager and say, this is what I need. But now suddenly you have to go talk to 15 different sites and see what their projected workloads are for the next three years and how many core counts uh, they're willing to share. So that takes a while and it takes convincing uh, other sites uh, of the need there's also always a difference between what the users think they want and their management thinks they want, so, so we have to work through all those issues. And then if our, uh, most of our IS is still enterprise oriented, so we, we have to convince our IT management that this is the way we want to go. So those, those are some of the challenges. There are also technical challenges uh, being all over the U.S., we have sites as far as Florida, West Palm Beach, Florida, and uh, San Jose, and New York, and Minnesota, and not all of them get the same response and latency and bandwidth. So how are we going to uh, overcome those? That's an ongoing challenge we're, we're working on. We want to ultimately, I guess this is the utopia, avoid all file transfers, right? So everything is in the data center 
but people do like to transfer files. They like to keep it where they can get to it very quickly. So, so bandwidth is, is an issue we have to deal with. Multiple applications. We run a variety of applications. We have one cluster that runs everything from CFD apps to FEA and non-MPI apps, single-threaded applications. And th this is the reason uh, I like to really have a, a job profiling tool. And the other gentleman mentioned about how to profile I.O., which is a big, if I know ahead of time when the user comes with a new application, I want to run this on 512 cores. What is that going to do to the system? And how much I.O. is it doing? And what time intervals is it doing the I.O.? I would be uh, very, it would be very useful for me to set up the policies and how many cores that can effectively use and efficiently use. Right now, I don't have a good tool. We just kind of react. We throw the application, let it run, and see what happens. Looking forward, uh, we, we are still we're starting to implement some of these things. Some of these things are our feature. When we have time to address it, uh, browser-based access, uh, we, we, we tried, like uh, Jim mentioned earlier, we tried Compute Manager. It was, was not being accepted while, you know, widely. So we're pretty much sticking to the uh, PBS scripts, canned scripts we've developed so far. But the PBS access looks really promising, so we're eager to get it and implement that. Remote visualization, as I mentioned, uh, we're trying to, as much as possible, avoid uh, file transfers so people can stay at their sites and uh, keep the data in the data center and still be able to post-process and, and view the results using nice DCV. So that's been working out quite well. Uh, this I already already mentioned. Uh, we're, we're still on a quest, I guess it's maybe the holy grail, a good uh, job profiling tool where I can pick a single job and say profile this particular job from start to finish. So at the end of it, I have a chart of uh, the I.O. characteristics, the memory uh, use through the entire length of the job. So I can turn it off and turn it off for particular jobs. Software licensing integration. Um, in some cases, this works. In other cases, um, where uh, applications simply die if you don't have a license, we'd like to be able to trap that and uh, make it wait in the queue until licenses are available. Since we have so many different sites uh, that are using it, their managers want some reporting. How much are our users using these tools and capacity-wise? So. I, I try to send emails out. It would be nice to be able to publish that on a website so people can go and look at it. I mentioned this already, a services dashboard. Is it a control center or is it a cloud or what, whatever that's going to be? Uh, it'd be nice to, I'd be happy to provide some feedback on that. But in all of these things, I feel like that uh, the vendor partnership is, is essential uh, for us because we're a very lean shop. There's like one equivalent uh, person supporting it, myself and uh, my assistant manager. I try to juggle other things in between. So we're really relying on uh, Altair and their expertise. So. We use several of uh, Altair tools at this point, uh, PBS Pro, of course, for job scheduling. Analytics tool that still, I think, leaves a little bit to be desired. Hopefully, the new uh, tools, with the Envision-based tools, will help us a little bit better. And these are some of the types of charts that I have to publish, uh, daily usage. Uh, and typically, we pull out PBS reports and pull them into Excel and generate these type of charts. Compute Manager, as I mentioned earlier, hopefully PBS Access will uh, be a huge step in that direction for people who don't want to get on a Linux system. Control Center, we've been using it a little bit, and we really like it. So we've given some feedback, so hopefully we'll continue to develop that. SAO is not really part of PBS Works, I don't think, but it, it is something that we use quite heavily across the company. 
to monitor license usage. I'd like to see how much of a certain license is being used uh, on the HPC versus on desktop workstations. So that those types of uh, analysis uh, is very handy to do with SAO. And uh, we also allocate some of the um, license charges based on how much each division uses. So SAO helps us to capture that as well. We do not charge back HPC services uh, at this point. Uh, corporate uh, IS has basically said this is a corporate resource. Anybody across the company can come and use it. So we're fortunate that way. I don't have to keep track of usage by division and build them back and all that kind of stuff. So any questions? It's after lunch, I know. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'll just ask cloud. C cloud is a bad word at, at our being, being a defense <laughs> being a defense contractor. Um, it's not something we're looking at actively. So maybe some point in the future where we know at least the corporate uh, management is uh, convinced that we can do that securely. Um, we're not going there. So obviously you used PBS to help your sort of consolidation. Yes. Um, how how did you go about that fair share? You know now you've got perhaps many different users using one big cluster. We do use fair share, but the problem with uh, managing so many different sites is their de their uh, expectations and demands go up and down all the time, suddenly there's a failure analysis at a one particular site, they use a, a lot more than their fair share, so to speak, but we can't totally cut them off after that. So fair share is there in the background, but uh, we don't totally rely on it. So we have to keep adjusting the policy. That's one of the challenges of um, consolidating across multiple divisions. So one of the one of the issues that I always foresaw using fair share was you mentioned about the why isn't my job running? Do you see mm -hmm. that even more with fair share? Because you have to then take into account well have they exceeded their fair share? Um, maybe Nate can answer this question. But typically when they do a, a, a Q stat or Q show, it gives you a reason. There's not enough uh, CPUs to satisfy your request or there's not enough licenses of this software or that software or uh, you have exceeded your user limit for example we allow I think 248 240 cores per user during the day but if they want to exceed that they will have to run on special queues which are checkpoint queues for example so your application has to be checkpointable then you have access to more cores because then when higher priority jobs come through, they can get out of the way. So they, those reasons are displayed when you do a queue show, and that's the only thing that they have. I don't know if Fairshare puts out any other special commands, do you, Nate? Yeah. Yeah, typically fair share comes into play when the system is busy all the time. So we we try not to run it at 100, close to 100% utilization. Uh, we're not a research organization. Oftentimes, people need to get things right right away. So when it's approaching 80, 85% utilization, we're, we may be in trouble. So we like to keep that headroom to allow different divisions, if they have a sudden need, to be able to accommodate that. So we don't see fair share kicking in all that much, at least not in our environment. Uh, okay, one more question and then we'll go on. You had mentioned that uh, you have many sites. Are uh, all your sites homogeneous? Uh, can users uh, run jobs at different sites? Do they, do they have, uh, is there an effort or a challenge to move their data around to run their jobs? 
I'm sure I understood the question. Different sites have... Well, you have different sites. Right. And one user is submitting to, uh, so on one site, can he move his uh, job over to a different site and run his ap application or his job? No, no. Each, each user is put in a group based on their sites. Their groups are named after the sites. So he belongs to that group. We don't really restrict uh, users from using more than what they're allocated, so to speak. So they can have access to a lot more cores than their site kind of so, signed up for. So each uh, site is, uh, has a specific usage. Uh, so you can't basically run a job, a job that is slated for one uh, site to another site. No, no, no. And some sites are very small, but their usage is very high. Maybe there's like two or three yeah. users that are running 1,000 uh, CFD jobs all the time. And there may be another site, there are 20 users, but their usage is very sporadic and minimal. So it's, it's hard to classify sites that way. Okay. Um, one question around, like, uh, do you have a lot of workstations that you need to consolidate? Workstations on desktops. Yeah. Yeah, we do have. You do have like, and and how do you handle data? So you know, sitting on people's desk, like when you consolidate them to a single data center. Well, all of our data, at least the HPC data, is sitting at the data center on our Panache storage server, and users can move it down if they want to. And. But typically, we, we try to encourage them to leave large data files on the, on the central site, on the HPC site, and, and do remote visualization. Or if they need to move it for archival purposes or whatever they need, maybe they move it off hours. So. Um, I think we'll end it there to move on. And thank you very much. Thank you.